I am Tim, welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. This evening, we are chatting live virtually the entire show. We're also gonna take a look at my hypothetical watch collection if I cast all of my previous preferences to the wind. All of that, plus I share your wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. Sean's on the switcher, this is Watchbox Studios. Edward Ledden, welcome, Desilus 2. We got Joe Pinto from Louisville. Some are from Budapest, in the box, stand up late with us in Europe. Enrique Cassiano, Ron H, and Jim Millet. Simon Holt joining in from Northern Ireland. Richard Combs from South Florida. Antelope, Arto Charles, and Time Hill. Thank you for being with us. Visit the folks who pay for these pixels, my favorite hardware store, thewatchbox.com, updated daily, multiple times per day. Chances are, if you don't see what you like, click refresh and you will. Over 3,000 watches live, including late model pre-owned and vintage, many brands and styles. Everyone should be able to find something they love for tax refund season on thewatchbox.com. We also have my Instagram. Join me where I showcase the world of Tim Masso. One minute reviews of watches that I consider the pick of the litter on our website, as well as an occasional glimpse into the life of Tim. Uh, just today I posted a Cartier clock. More on that later in the show. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not the kind you put on your desk. But check out my Instagram, Tim underscore Masso. Okay, jumping into the box with Mark S. from Brooklyn, Sean Hansen. We've got Curtis A. joining in from sunny San Diego on America's left coast. We've got Geezer in the box. He says, I love you, Tim Geezer. It's mutual. Thank you very much. So this evening... I'm going to be chatting live, making the most of the format of the show. I usually spend maybe six, seven, eight minutes talking to you guys in the chat box. Tonight, I am honoring the format. The reason we do this at 5 p.m. U.S. Eastern is not so I can deliver an extended monologue to a camera. It's so we can talk to each other, and there's going to be more of that. Let's start with a few of yours on mine. I asked you answered. Viewer wrist shots, number one. Daniel A. sports a killer. Erverk, you are 100. Ultra Violet in Montro. Is that some smoke on the water I see? We have Seb A in his MBNF HM3 Black Frog, taken in America's natural beauty at the Grand Canyon. We've got Omer S and his Vacheron Constantin overseas self winding, traversing the Zurich landscape, that's Lake Zurich in the background, by Porsche 911. No better way to see Switzerland by road. We've got Paolo M of Philadelphia sharing his handsome Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Chronicle. And Audemar the Corgi. I like it. Matching watch to dog. We have Craig and Archie, both of them, exploring Geneva with Audemars Piguet on a trip that also included a stop at the Audemars Piguet Museum. And Scott L., a man after my own heart, rocks the road with a Corvette C7 Stingray Z51. I'm actually looking at one locally next week. And the Blanc Pen 50 Fathoms, a watch I desire but probably can't pull off on a 16 centimeter road. Wrist. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see a few of yours on mine. Let's see what's going on. We've got Curtis A saying, DJ the pug is sleeping through today's show. I need to post some photos of my mom's new pug, Squash. Squash is adorable. He was about this big last time I saw him. Now he's like this big and starting to look a little bit chunky. I guess that's the life cycle of a pug. What else is going on? We've got Shane A in the box. Keystar G60. Neo saying, hello, humanity. Hello, Neo. And Miroslav are joining in. Okay, T and Tickers. Christopher Ward on a NATO strap is the only watch you need. Don't undersell Christopher Ward. The, the movements from Chris Ward watches make it into watches a lot of anti-Chris Ward guys would actually enjoy. And I actually have to give them credit for making fun complications available at a very low price. We also have Time Hill saying, love the wrist shots and the corgi. Guys, we love watches and wheels, but we also love watches and whiskers. Whether that is a cat dog or maybe a chinchilla, send them to me, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, and I will post your wrist shots. Steve 1010, good afternoon, Tim. Keep up the excellent work. That's very kind of you. Okay. So news and events in the life of Tim Masso. We just hit 100 million views on Watchbox Reviews. That's a channel I created in 2017 to separate what you're watching now, which is themed programming, from the straight up short form watch reviews. Check out 
Watchbox Reviews, if you like my old school talking hands, they are the original talking hands videos on YouTube. And uh, of course we have the new Collector's Guide series, which is the high-end version of my standard review. Also, that Cartier clock, let's rewind. I mentioned it earlier, I was looking at a 1978 Lincoln Mark V over the weekend. Yes, that is the glorious 77 to 79 Lincoln Mark V, the largest two-door car ever made in the United States. But what really caught my eye, and I may buy the Lincoln, I'll let you know if I do, was that it included the Cartier clock which is billed as the first ever five joule chronometer in an American car. Let's jump back to the Mark III of 1969. The first ones came with a generic clock. Later in 1969, they started Cartier branding their clocks and they gradually became more elaborate. So by the time we get to the Mark V in 1977, I don't know if we can go full screen with that, but it's a traditional analog display clock. It's also got a day, a date, and an AM PM indicator, which just killed me, especially since these things were Cartier branded, but made by General Time Corp in North Carolina. So perhaps not quite as haute as the labeling suggests, but if you wanted more Cartier in your Mark V, you could always get the Cartier Designers Edition, which included, among many other things, Cartier signed opera windows. All right, jumping back into the box, let's see what's going on. We got Mark 5493 saying hello. Salim joining in saying, hey, Tim. Hello, Salim. Good to see you. Jerry Adams coming in from Colorado. That's where my sister lives, and you're in good company there. We've got... Gel Mibson, always a loyalist on the channel and much appreciated. And Deech2086 joining in from Western Massachusetts, where it's very cold in the winter. Okay, casting call for my collective conversations. That's Rick Remicker right there. He gave one hell of a turn on our collector conversation series. This one was dovetailed with our Perpetually Patek segment. If you want to be on Watchbox Studios, Email me, mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. If you're in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or Philadelphia, general area, or even Baltimore or Washington, D.C., let me know. We will come to you because I want to paint a picture of the collector that is authentic. I want to talk about the watches that you find fascinating. I want to hear your stories in your own words and not always be the guy talking. So more listening, less talking. That's Collector Conversations. Reach out to me, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. We might even be able to come to you no matter where you are because we've got Watchbox locations everywhere. Okay. Viewer wrist shots number two. Before we jump into that, let's see what you guys are saying. Time Hill, congrats on 100 million views. I appreciate that. We got Gag saying, well done, Tim, on the volume. Scott Roberts speaks Lincoln. He's talking about the Bill Blass and Givenchy signature editions. It's true. They had the designer series. They had Cartier, Bill Blass, Givenchy, and Emilio Pucci. And the idea was that you would add $8,000 to your roughly like $11,000 car, and you would wind up with the Mark Five designer series, and many of these things were in exceptionally tenuous taste. Remember, it was the late 1970s. Neoclassical, especially when laced with velour, was very much in. We have Sam D. Tim, what do you think about purple dials? I like them, but it's a very powerful thing. Moser did a couple of purple dials a few years back, and they were extremely contentious. They, they sold well, but people love them or hate them. Now, I'm talking to Armand Biard tomorrow about uh, doing some collaborative watch designs, and we're going to discuss many different design concepts, one of which, for me, is actually going to be a purple dial with cyan, breguet-style Arabic numerals, and I guess we're going to find out how far you can stretch the purple dial concept because I really like it. I just think it has a tendency to be overpowering in the same sense that yellow gold, if used on too large a scale, can be completely overpowering. Time Hill, a shout out for a good friend Rick saying he has a fantastic collection. He does and he's on our Talking Time with Tommaso Facebook group. If you want to learn more, he's very active on that platform. And Jim Millett enjoyed the video with Rick. We've got Simon Holt saying, Anne Ordain on the list soon. 
I definitely agree with that. They will do a lot of custom stuff, including purple enamel dials for very reasonable prices. So if you're interested in purple dials, it's best to go with a company that will tailor the amount of purple that you desire, as well as the other details. And Anne Ordain, they're very open about being all about the dial. Less about the case, less about the movement, but all about the dial. And for a small brand that sells watches in the low four-figure range, that's absolutely appropriate. What else is going on? Time and test joining from Portland. I definitely appreciate hearing from our folks in Portland, Maine. We've got Bessel Junk O saying, has anyone attended Inorgenta München? So I've never been to Munich, but if anyone has been to that and you would like to do a review in our rolling chat, please let us know. Geezer, Patek 2023 predictions. Well, guys, this is going to be a show in and of itself, so I don't want to show my hand too much, but I predict that we're going to start to see new variants of the 5811. I think we'll see new dial variants of existing models. I'd frankly be shocked if we didn't at some point see a precious metal 5212 weekly calendar. And I also think that the standard Aquanaut is past due for some revisions. So we might see a wholesale redesign of the 5167 at some point, because other than the arrival of a new movement, we haven't really seen any changes since 2007. And with the 5811 likely to be a lower volume piece for a while, I expect to see some innovation on the Aquanaut side. I would also advise that uh, it's always possible to see new dial variants of existing models, as it seems we've seen a whole bunch of copper salmon and green dial variants of existing Patek Philippe watches and it's just likely that they're going to continue to iterate a little bit and I don't mind that. Sometimes you find your perfect match not with an all new model but with a new version of an existing model. Salam is saying, I am a dentist and purple is actually the color of dentistry. How cool would it be to have it on an enamel dial? You know, there are a lot of companies that'll do custom. Debitune will do custom, Moser will do custom. It's not just a matter of getting custom pieces from the likes of the Anordains of the world. So if you have a small brand and you ask politely, oftentimes you can get purple. Even F.P. Jorn has been known to do an occasional custom purple dial. I know because I've seen it. Also, Geezer saying, the Platinum 5212 weekly calendar would be very cool. Gail Mibson saying, just realized that Moser and Abel have the same bracelets. Yes, that bracelet and the extensible clasp is used by Moser, Abel, IWC, Glasuta Original, Langa on the Odysseus, and at least a couple of others. Because whenever you see that little B signature, that means Brogioli, and they make that part. And whenever you see the extensible clasp that has a push button and a little rack regulator inside the clasp, again, it's the exact same system. It's used by many, many companies. Just as the GNF Chatelain Leaf Spring Deployant Clasp on Richard Mille watches is used by a million other companies. There are these parts that you start to recognize the more watches you experience and you start to connect the dots of suppliers within and without Switzerland. We've got Alexander DeWolf from joining in from Sydney, getting up early with us in Australia. What are your thoughts on modern day Gerard Perigo? Well, frankly, I really need to go to GP because I don't know how much of the old company still exists. My understanding was that under the ownership of Caring, a great deal of Ulysse Norden and Gerard Perigo production was consolidated into um, homogenized facilities, and I don't know how independent GP still is. The GP of the Macaluso era was incredible, building the highest of high horology, the greatest of craft arts, and a broad range of watches that were as interesting at the low end as they were at the top. They suffered badly under carrying ownership, a period during which almost all of the value of the original company was destroyed by incompetent management and advertising. Now, as of the last couple of months, bought out by their management, both UN and GP, essentially one company, very difficult to judge how they complement each other because I always thought of the GP collector being very similar to the UN collector. They're also similar brands with similar volumes and it even seems similar products. I love the back catalog of GP. The things they've made in the past from the Esmeralda, which is Grubel 4C level, uh, to X 
exceptionally accessible watches like the old Ferrari chronographs or the Laureatos or the Laureato Evo 3s or the Seahawks. Cool watches, great prices. The R&D01. How do you get a motorsports chronograph for sub Rolex prices? Simple. You buy the GP, which is a more interesting watch on top of that. And because the senior Macaluso was both a rally champion and the owner of Gerard Perigo. He interviewed race car drivers to make sure the r and one would be the watch race car drivers wanted to use and own. So there's a lot of great past GP available, and I even think the new casket is bold, and at the price it's offered, a very attractive prospect. I just have to see how independent it can be going forward from Ulysse Norden, a company that has a very strong identity and from what I understand, retains more of its intrinsic manufacturing than the old Gerard Perigo company did. GP, if you're out there, reach out to me. Let's do a discussion, add it to the podcast, and if I'm wrong, correct the record. Dodgy, is Tim wearing an RM? No, this was on a previous episode. This is a Azimuth Mr. Roboto that they sent to me essentially as an indefinite loan in return for a review, which I did. But again, when I get free stuff, I always want you guys to know it's basically product placement. I'll let you know when I buy a watch with my own money. That said, I like this quite a bit. It's a big bronze block that's a GMT, a regulator, and a retrograde. And I had fun with the sort of unofficial Azimuth Club out in Singapore when I went out there in January. We did some group shots. Uh, Azimuth is a Singaporean brand, but they do manufacture in Switzerland. Reach out to Chris Young if you want to hear more about them. I'm a big fan of Mr. Roboto here, but also the twin turbo because I'm a car guy. We've got... Kamikazdan, who's joining in, finally caught it live. Welcome and thank you for joining our show. This one is all live and interactive. We are chatting in the box. I'm not afraid to walk without a net and I am live theater. There is no script, there is no program. Curtis Arndt, Tim Masso, still waiting on the collector conversation that we wanted to do in 2020 but was postponed by the virus. Can we do it on a trip to SoCal? Yes, we can, Curtis, because I'm going to be in LA from the 16th through the 18th of March. If you can make it to Los Angeles at Watchbox, we will shoot that thing, get it done, and we will finally seal the deal that we first mooted back in 2020. Again, the 16th, the 17th, and the 18th. Reach out to Watchbox LA. We will make that happen. We got Eric R. joining from Southern Utah. Eric R. is a familiar face in the box. And we've got... Jeff G. joining in from Alaska, the snowy white north of the, of the United States. It's the, not the lower 48, but it's still great. What else is going on here? we got Tanner Tran joining in from Houston, where I have to say there is a car culture second to none. I spent some time there when I was in the Navy, and I could not believe the level of car connoisseurship that exists there. Yeah, you've got American muscle, but you've also got K cars from Japan. You've got gray market Euro imports. You've got the hot rod scene. It was very, very cool. All right, so let's talk about viewer wrist shots number two, because I asked, and you guys answered, and Hanan G here is navigating Banff, Alberta with his AP Royal Oak Chronograph. Ah, smell the air of the great outdoors. It's like a peppermint patty for your nose. We have Xavier N navigating the traffic uh, by Mini with his Rolex Daytona steel ceramic, looking good. Uh, not exactly a race pace, but you've got the right watch for it. Chris F shares a his and hers birthday shot, hers to be sure, on the way to lunch in Ball Harbor, Florida, not far from Watchbox Boca and Watchbox Miami. And look at that, she drives a manual transmission. She wears a Rolex and she drives a stick shift. She is a keeper. John S. Sports is Ulysse Norden, Classico Monera, miniature painted enamel dial. And I have to say, thank God, John, that you sent that Monera. It's a little bit provocative, but guys, if you haven't seen the other ones, dot, dot, dot. Let's just say that is by far the tamest portrayal in the series. <laughs> they were much discussed at the S.E. Ashash that year. Elton H. and his Rolex Daydater in Portobello, Dublin and Locke's Restaurant. And as I rushed, th I rushed through my dictation last week, I included Dublin as part of the UK. I am deeply sorry. I was a geography biz uh, whiz in... Uh, grade school and the sixth grade version of me could have chided the I guess now 38 year old version of me believe me I did not mean to slight Dublin guys I, I did not mean to slight the UK either and I love that you've got what appears to be a green dial day date in Ireland 
Bon Appetit, what else is going on? Well, it could be you. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, let's keep that going. I did so love geography when I was a kid. It's the consequence of having globes in the classroom. Parents today, when, when you go into your kids' classrooms, do they still have physical globes that you can spin? Or am I showing my age there? All right, we got Enrique C. Tim, when will the podcast return? It should return this week. Uh, I've got podcasts lined up with William Messina and John Reardon, plus I'm going to do one that is entirely the hypothetical build-out of a collection I'm going to tease in this episode. And I would also like to honor Mark S., who's asking, Tim, would you recommend buying Grand Seiko Quartz new or pre-owned? I know you buy a Submariner new and a Breguet pre-owned, just not sure on Grand Seiko Quartz. Well, this is going to come down to two things. One, are you only able to get it new or only able to get it used? If it's discontinued, you're probably only going to be able to get it used. If it is new and brand new, it may not be available used yet. There's also the question of warranty. Grand Seiko doesn't offer quite as much warranty as some of the other brands, which means you might want to have a little bit more of a cushion. But I would say, realistically, the number one reason you would buy a Grand Seiko new is because you value the quality of the case finishing and you don't want one that's been marred. And I have to say that it is very easy to scratch a case that has been hand black polished. So if you trust yourself, you're careful, and you want it as clean as possible, you're probably going to want to shoot for new. The pricing's also pretty fair. So unless you're looking at some sort of micro artist studio spring drive, we're not talking about a huge price premium over pre-owned, though to be sure, Grand Seiko pre-owned quartz is going to cost less. Figure it'll be somewhere between 10 and 20% less. Uh, depending on the age. No reason to buy anything other than a full box and paper, as there are many of them. They're not as common as Rolex, Omega, or Breitling, but they are still mass-produced. So I would consider that to be the guideline. Again, you know your appetite, appetite for risk and also scratches. So that's that. What else is going on? Sam Sharm, better brand to start a relationship with, Vacheron or Patek? I'm going to say Patek, and it's because of experiences people have had with Richemont vendors. So, I know a guy who spends money, cost no object, on Langa. And he spent a lot of money at a Langa store that was an authorized retailer. He later went back asking to buy a new limited edition, and they told him, well, they closed his old dealer, which was authorized, again, not a factory boutique, but an authorized dealer. They closed his old dealer, so he went to a new one, and they basically treated him as though he had spent no money on Langa watches, because he hadn't spent it with a factory boutique. Now, again, this is a guy who had spent over half a million dollars on Langa alone, and much more on other Richemont brand watches, and they treated him like he was walking in the door for the first time. And at this point, if you don't get any credit for spending money on Richemont watches, regardless of the door or the vendor, I'm not sure I can really trust any Richemont company to do justice to a collector who wants to establish, quote, a relationship. There's also the very real possibility that if you go to a Vacheron retailer that's not the factory boutique and they close, you'll be treated as though you've never bought a Vacheron watch. You'll have no seniority when it comes time to order up an exclusive piece. And I would also say realistically, look, Patek is run with a view to the future. Richemont brands are run with a view to the next fiscal quarter. And so I don't know how many, honestly, I, I don't know what a relationship is worth with a company that is purely interested in shareholder relationships and less interested in customer relationships. Uh, so I would say realistically, unless you know for a fact that your Vacheron dealer is going to be around forever and that the people working at that particular boutique are going to be there long term, I would focus on Patek. They open up new doors very slowly. They only, with the exception of their one showroom in Geneva, they only work through authorized dealers, which means every Patek dealer is on the same footing. Your money counts the same everywhere. And they're also less likely to do things 
that are geared towards making, you know, geared towards a victory on a single transaction where you walk away with such a bad taste in your mouth that you never want to do it again, but the vendor is happy because they made the sale. A Patek dealership is less likely to do that. And also, I think the Patek company will still be in the hands of the Stearns in 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, Vacheron may still be owned by Richemont, but I mean, who really knows who's going to be running Richemont at that point, or what shareholder group will have the majority interest. So uh, look, guys, I'm going to say if you're going to start a relationship with a brand, make sure it's a brand that's interested in having a relationship with you. Okay, what else is going on in the box? This chat box moves fast. Let me jump real quick into some stuff I wanted to discuss because I have this ideal crazy watch collection and my idea here is to give you a list of watches uh, that you've never heard me discuss before. So regular viewers of this show know all about my dreams, grails, and tastes. There are some watches you've seen so many times you're ready to gag. But what if I were to rule out all of my favorites and select all new watches that I've not previously placed on my list or discussed on this show? So let's talk about these watches, starting with vintage, the Louis Vuitton LV1. Uh, this is the Monterey World Time. It's a multi-time zone. It's a world time. It's a retrograde date, it's a moon phase. Uh, that's James Dowling's personal example right there. This was the first ever Louis Vuitton watch. It was launched in 1988. It was designed by an architect, uh, Gay Olenti, and she designed it for Louis Vuitton, which then contract manufactured it with IWC. This is a very special piece. It was available in yellow gold, white gold, as you see right there on James's wrist, and then also in ceramic at a time when IWC was just beginning to toy with the material, which says basically not only is this a foundational piece for LV, but it was one of the original ceramic watches if you find that version of it out there. So this would be my choice among vintage watches because it's genuine luxury. Yes, it's quartz, but if you can't distinguish between Happy Meal grade quartz, like the kind you would get as a free toy in the Happy Meal and luxury quartz, which is the kind that is of heirloom quality, uh, you need to go back to formula. This is a great example of how quartz can be luxury and even how quartz can be vintage. Now, H. Moser and C, The Endeavor. This is a really cool watch that just came out. I'm finally free to talk about this. If you saw their tantalum abyss enamel dial perpetual calendar that came out last week, this is the 10-piece limited edition version of that. This is a lapis lazuli dial we did as a Govberg limited edition of 10. It's 42 millimeters. The case is blue-gray tantalum, and it's the Andreas Streller perpetual calendar system. So you've got a little stub hand right there underneath the primary hands. 12 hours, 12 months, that's how it indicates the month. So you can see the little stub is pointing towards 6. That means it's June, and then it's June 29th. That's how you read it. There's a power reserve at 9 rated seven days. In fact, it'll run for nine days before it stops. Super cool. That would be my choice among calendar watches if we're not talking Debitun and we're not talking my much-loved Patek Philippe 5236P. This thing has everything going on, including what you can't see, which is the back, where it has a double hairspring, two flat hairsprings, 180 degrees opposed, achieving instantly what a tourbillon would normally achieve over a period of minutes in a pocket watch, this can achieve as a wristwatch. And it looks good too. Uh, I cinched it down a bit so it's pinching my wrist, but it's a good fit. I love this thing. Uh, they did 10 of them. They also did 10 in jade, but after seeing the jade and the lapis, I am all about the lapis. So that would be my choice among calendar watches. Now, Yuli Snarden. I love UN. And someday we're going to do an episode about all the cool stuff made in the Rolf Schneider era that you absolutely have to buy before the market discovers it. But I'm going to focus on one that I consider to be the minute repeater of alarm watches, the Yuli Snarden Sonata. And this is the Silesium model that came out back in 2008. It was a 500 piece edition, rose gold, white gold, 500 pieces each. It's a dual time but it's also a minute repeater style chiming device 
hitched to an alarm. So it has conventional repeater strikers, a repeater governor, which you can see down at about 7 o'clock on the dial, and then it has repeater gongs that encircle the movement one and a half times, so they're cathedral gongs. The dial has a sliver of silicon, which UN makes in-house, and the alarm has a unique system where you can set it in a 24-hour format so it knows the difference, for example, between 12 noon and 12 midnight, but you can also set it in a countdown format. So if you know you need an alarm, in three hours. You can set it for a three hour countdown and it has a bi-directional quick set system for its double digit date which is really really cool. This watch has it all including UN's own proprietary silicon hairspring and a nicely decorated albeit distantly Lemagne based movement. UN used those for years. For me this is as good as it gets among alarm watches and while there may be more expensive alarms like the Patek Philippe 5520 for example, I don't think there are any finer sounding alarms and yes that includes the likes of Breguet, Patek and Harry Winston all of which have built minute repeater chiming alarm watches. This is as good as it gets. And by the way, reasonable prices. For a watch that originally cost almost 60 grand back in 2008, you'll pay between about 18,000 and 23,000 to get one of those today. Okay, a watch that I've mentioned but never in the context of my own collecting ambitions from England real British watchmaking, right down to the small parts like the dial in the hands, the Charles Frodsham double impulse chronometer. This is a watch that includes an immense amount of assistance from the late great Derek Pratt. Uh, it's from Charles Frodsham, which dates back to the 1830s. They are holders of royal warrants as suppliers of timepieces to the British monarchy and they launched their first wristwatch in 2018, initially making only about 12 per year. 42 millimeters because the mechanism is large. You had your choice of either white gold or more intriguingly, what we have right here, which is 22 carat pale yellow gold and a rare exception to my usual, this would be my choice. The pale yellow gold looks fantastic like vintage 7, 9, or 14 carat. You can see it has a lovely unsigned crown in vintage fashion. The dial is made of porcelain cooked in England and you can see the hands on this watch made manually and fired manually alongside applique uh, Arabic numerals on the dial that are also fired. You can also get a royal warrant dial if you want that has their royal warrant shields on there and the movement Oh my gosh, the movement. At the top of that picture, there's a snail cam that doubles as a power reserve. You could see that it's got a spectacular tri-spoke balance bridge. The balance is free sprung and modern, but the hairspring is beautifully archaic, a hand formed overcoil. Look at that black polish on the bridge. They even have custom shock protection. And then if you look below that, you can see Char uh, Derek Pratt's contribution, two barrels driving two escape wheels directly impulsing the balance like the Breguet natural escapement. It is a double direct impulse system unlike the Breguet which was unreliable due to the gearing of the two wheels together. Each of these wheels has an independent drivetrain so there's no problem with synchronization or excess friction. It was a brilliant product that took over a decade to bring to market representing real courage and ambition and the best possible finish. Very British, very very desirable. And what's it cost? Well, that's a great question. When it first came out, it was around 65,000 pounds, later 75,000, I think right around 100,000 US dollars today to buy one new. And I think that's the white gold. I think it's a little bit less for yellow, but good luck finding one. I've heard their wait list is three years and justifiably. These have auctioned for $200,000 pre-owned, which is to say getting your hands on one is worth twice retail to the market at large. I adore this. And the company is owned by these two old watchmakers, Richard Stenning and Philip White, who do restorations, reconstructions, clocks, watches, everything. When you see them at watch events, they're super enthused. They bring their restorations of marine chronometers from the 19th century that are still functional. The kind of stuff they still see every single day in their atelier in England. As good as it gets from independent brands. We got Keeping Watch UK saying this is Great Britain right there and I emphasize the great. We've got Soma R saying still better waiting time than a Daytona. 
Jimmy saying pure class. And right here, we've got Jim Millett saying it's a watch masterclass from Professor Masso. I don't know that I've earned my professor's tenure just yet, but as I advance in watchmaking on the side, I feel like I'm more qualified. I'm moving towards it. I'm not there yet, but when I have what I know now, plus the watchmaking, then we can talk about tenure. What else is going on? Eric R. looking at that fraudman saying killer dials and also saying one of my grails, fraudsham dual impulse as good as it gets. Let's interact with the chat box right here. We got Mason one hi from the UK. Tim, I've just snagged an unworn Zin 903 H2 navigation chronograph just today. Limited edition of 220 from 2007 Lamagna 1872 manual wind waiting on delivery. Yeah, the Lamagna 1872 is the two chronograph register version of the 1873 that for a long time was the basis for the movement in the Moonwatch. And while the Moonwatch's new 3861 is still distantly Lamagna based, it's not as close as it used to be. Also, fun fact, if you want to see the world's best finished uh, Lamagna 1872, check out the Vacheron Constantin Medicus chronograph and check it out fully skeletonized and engraved. What else is going on in the box? We got Justin D saying, I've had many complicated haute horlogerie watches, including some of the ones you have on your list. Unfortunately, they did not keep my interest as much as more simple watches. That's okay. We all have different desires. I'm very much about complications. I love complicated watches. The exception would be if the watch itself is simple, but the mechanism is highly sophisticated. Uh, think of the, the dual impulse chronometer from Bernard Lederer. Bernard Lederer's dual impulse chronometer is possibly the simplest time-only watch and the most complex on the reversed side. Uh, that's a great example of something that would interest me, even though it's not a highly complicated watch with functions. The way it tells time is incredible. And of course, there's the Fraudsham, which has an incredibly sophisticated mechanism, but outwardly has just the three hands. Uh, you know, there's also something like the Richard Langa Pour Le Marit from Alanga Unzona, where again, it's just a three hand watch, but it's got a fusée and chain with hundreds upon hundreds of parts, and it's gorgeous. Uh, we have Tim Baker asking, Thoughts on the Patek 5035 as an affordable annual calendar? Well, whenever we're talking about a Patek 5035, which is either white gold or rose gold and a Patek, we're going to have to mention that it's not precisely affordable by most definitions, but relative to what people are paying for some other Patek watches, I think it's a real buy opportunity as I do think the market will discover it in the future. They didn't build too, too many in white gold and they're not building too, too many in rose gold. So I think it's a great prospect. It's very high on innovation high on style. It's hugely representative of Patek Philippe's heritage, right down to the custom vintage style pin buckle, which pretty much no other Patek has. It's high on legibility of the calendar and low on legibility of the time. So if you don't value the time, but you value the calendar, go for it. I do find that the micro rotor movement introduced is particularly attractive. And I've even had some folks say that they like the version of the 31260 in the 5035 more than they like it in the 5236 perpetual calendar. Okay, Ron H. saying, great show, Tim. Have a great day, night, all. You got to run. I appreciate that, Ron. Thanks for sticking with us. The rest of you, we are just getting started. Let's talk about another watch that's near and dear to me, the Resonance Type 3N. I once had a dream about a watch that had a edge-to-edge -edge dial. No bezel, no case, no lugs, no crown. This is the closest thing to the picture I had in the dream. This is the Type 3N blue dial. You can see it's got a day indicator. It's got a date indicator. It's got a temperature indicator because it's full of oil. Oh, approximately 37.5 milliliters, or basically one shot of tequila. And it has an expansion system in the form of bellows internally to deal with the flux in temperature. It's an automatic winder. It's set with the case back. If you want to manually wind it, it is wound with the case back. And because the oil has the same index of refraction as the sapphire crystal, from any angle, this 44 millimeter sapphire and titanium watch is perfectly readable. And the loom is epic. Also, if you look, it's a regulator. That is a cool watch. They cost about 40,000 US dollars. And as far as I'm concerned, well worth it. These are remarkably easy to service since the module, which is self-lubricating and floats in oil, is sealed for life. 
All that has to get done at the end of the day is a service on the ETA base. I really like this watch. I think the Type 3 was Resence's masterpiece. Now, Montre KF, here's the thing. Tourbillon watches, by their nature, are fine, delicate things. They don't want to get wet, they don't want to get shocked, they don't want to get broke, even though they do it easily, and for the most part, you have to wear them in sedate confines. They're great for the opera, for dinner, for the cinema, for the office. But these days, we want to wear our luxury watches all the time. We don't want to deal with the limitations of a delicate traditional mechanism, even as we value its beauty and link to history. Enter the Montre KF 8 Tourbillon. So, this is the meteorite version where they engrave a meteorite-like pattern onto either a rose gold or a steel case. Now, Montre KF is the brand of watchmaker Karsten Freisdorf. He's a German working in La Chaux de Fonds, and he's been refining this watch for a couple of years. It started with the original Spirograph tourbillon, which was built around his notion of a crazy marine chronometer tourbillon that you can wear on your wrist. As a watchmaker, he fell in love with marine chronometers. And this crazy marine chronometer design he has is built on the premise that a huge amount of inertia, as well as robust construction, can make a tourbillon an everyday wearable complication, but also a sports watch complication. And yes, I do consider a tourbillon to be a complication. It adds complexity. There you can see the design. It is a fully self-compensating, massive inertia, high polar moment tourbillon that even includes customization and loom if you want it. You can also see how sophisticated the mechanism is. It actually changes its geometry as the temperature is altered, and it's got double overcoils inside and outside with a nice slow 18K beat rate, which I find aesthetically wonderful. Uh, this is a tourbillon that is braced against 5,000 G of shock, which is to say, the same shock resistance as a NASA certified moon watch. It's also anti-magnetic to 1000 Gauss or mil Gauss. And that's about as good as you can ask. Add loom, including all the loom you want in customization and surface swimmable water resistance. And you've got a watch that I would like to own. If you can go back to the original uh, photo of the watch, Sean, this is a timepiece that offers full custom for around $100,000. The dial, the numerals, the color, the engraving, the case size, the case material, the use of loom on the front or on the back, all of this can be tailored. So you're not just gonna get a watch, you are gonna get the watch that you want and no two are gonna be exactly the same. It's a big watch at 44 and a half millimeters, but I wore one throughout Dubai Watch Week 2021 and I found it was actually a good fit. It's only 12.2 millimeters thick, so it's like Daytona thickness. If you're okay with the Daytona, you're probably gonna be okay with this. This makes the Tourbillon everyday wearable. It's finally a Tourbillon that you can wear just about anywhere you would wear a Rolex. Jumping into the box right here, we have Goonie saying Tourbillon doesn't exactly scream sports watch for the most part. We've got Alvin joining in from Singapore, getting up early with us. Judson Van Meter asking, is the Mark V Lincoln bigger than the 64 Buick Electra 225? Yes. Assuming the Electra 225 back in 64 still stuck to its billing, which is 225 inches, the 77 to 79 Lincoln Mark V was 230 inches, which would make it five inches longer than the Electra 225. Andrew T, not really a fan of the Karsten saying this one looks like a Zelos, to each his own. Andrew T also asking, Tim, what's the most complex modular movement you've ever seen? I would say in terms of adding modular complications, it's probably the new Caliber 1000 in the Audemars Piguet Universelle because the automatic base is the 4302 that you can get in any Code 1159 or Royal Oak automatic, and then all the other crap is built on both sides of it. That includes the perpetual calendar, the tour beyond, the split second flyback chronograph, and the minute repeater. So that's probably, given that it is modular construction, uh, the most complicated modular construction I've ever seen. I would also say realistically something like the IWC uh, Destriero Scafusia, which was built on a manual winding version of a 7750, the 7760. So those are probably my nominations on that front.
Okay, another watch that I would like to add, the Eva Loeba Ari. If you've never heard of Eva Loeba, she's a Berlin-born German watchmaker who's practiced widely, including in Switzerland and for years in Australia. She worked for a number of years for Rolex, but also for independent watch maestro Thomas Prescher, during which she gained experience building customized and complicated watches. She launched the first watch under her own name, the Ari, right there, named after her first son. She is a very low volume practitioner who currently works, I believe, in the Zurich metropolitan area. And her watch costs about $100,000, but it's worth the price of admission. The case is entirely hand engraved and handcrafted by one of her collaborators. She then crafts the movement, which includes an extraordinary combination of a form caliber. It's not just rectangular, it's arced. It uses bevel gears to transmit the energy from the crown wheel to the barrel through the drivetrain all the way to the barrel balance. Note that the crown and the balance are at opposite ends of the watch. It is super thin too, and only about 12 millimeters. It's 21 millimeters wide. It's about 52 millimeters from side to side. And while that might sound imposing at first glance, it actually fits just fine. She's rather petite and she can wear it and it'll wear just fine on any male wrist. Of course, a certain amount of customization is available as the case can be had in any number of golds, but also in platinum. And because these are made on an as needed basis rather than inventoried, you will be able to order pretty much the watch you want as you want it. She's one of our few ladies working in independent horology and she's definitely worth recognizing on that basis. Eva Loiba, look her up, definitely worth getting into. It's showing just how broad the world of independent horology is, you wind up meeting small volume practitioners like this who basically don't advertise and don't need to because they have a small and loyal clientele. Now, a watch that's similar in some regards and long discontinued, the Baudelet Ivresse. In French, the word means drunkenness, and that sort of describes the shape of this watch. So it was designed by uh, Eric Giroux, who is a longtime friend of Max Busser and has designed most MBNF watches. The actual watchmaking was done by David Kando, who is quite well known in high horology circles, and the watch is a form watch in platinum made in 30 pieces in 2012. I don't even know that they made all 30 pieces. This is a watch that is 53.6 by 30 millimeters, so it is big. It's bigger than the Auri, uh, but it has a 120 hour power reserve, and the case back of this thing is absolutely bonkers. This is bevel gears taken to the state of the art. First, you have a wonderful pocket watch style ratcheting uh, click atop the barrel. Then on the other side, you have a flying tourbillon with a lovely infinity symbol atop. Uh, you can see that that symbol is echoed in the sapphire form of the case back. And then we have this bonkers shaped movement that's made out of German silver, handsomely frosted, immaculately beveled, and about as good as good gets. No wait, not good, great. That was a watch that cost a freaking fortune at the time, 200,000 Swiss francs. Even here, seeing every pre-owned watch ever made, I've never encountered one. Guys, if you've got one of these, send me the wrist shot, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. All right, we got Miroslav saying, your comments are gold. I, I don't know if that was uh, directed at Gel right there. I think Gel Mibson, who's one of our favorites in the chat box and one of our channel mainstays, He's getting complimented by Miroslav for his outstanding commentary. And uh, I, you know, I've got to echo that. He's always the first to post on any of my videos. I appreciate his support and his insights. And he mentions that I'm preaching. I try not to be preachy, but I do on occasion. What else is going, cool, going on? At Alvin says, this timepiece with a curve is cool. And I got to agree. And we got Daniel Lopez Martinez. Tim, what do you think about the Patek 5726A? I like it. But do you like it? That's a lot of money. You got to make the commitment of your own volition there. Okay, wrist shots number three. Sam E. and his vintage Rolex Datejust report from Salt Lake City before the imposing Rocky Mountains. We've got James H. and his 2011 JLC Master Calendar rolling in his Range Rover Sport. Looking good. You know I love our watches and wheels. Giancarlo P. celebrates the birth of his first child with an heirloom Panerai Luminor 299. It was his father's. It's now his. It will soon be his son's. 
Adrian A. and his fiance brave gators with Rolex, a his and hers in the Florida Everglades. Watch out, they've got teeth. Joseph P. times the stoplight Grand Prix with his Tudor Black Bay chronograph behind the wheel of his Porsche. All right. Jumping back into the box, we got Jimmy saying, amazing Loiba watch. Goonie saying, the amount of money you need to buy this is crazy. And a Mick in Florida asking, how long is it? The, uh, which one, the Everest or the Ari? The Ari is about 52.6. The Everest is about uh, 53.5. What else is going on in the box? Watch enthusiast saying, hi, Tim. Thoughts on the Chapek Antarctique undecided between the two sizes? Uh, I like the smaller one. I like the smaller traditional size, and I've, I've tried the larger case, and it was just too big for me. So if you use my 16 centimeter circumference wrist as a reference point, the original Antarctique, yes. The split, no. What else is going on? Mark S. saying, Tim is on fire tonight. I really appreciate that. And, you know, Sean anticipated this. He provided water to put out the fire, as he often does. All right. I asked you answer, doubling up, viewer wrist shots number four, David J. And his blue Cartier Santos braved the weather from behind the wheel of his Tesla. You got the mechanical watch in the quartz car right there. Dr. S. Reports from his porch in Puerto Rico with a Rolex Daytona themed beverage, properly attired. We have Zach T. of Singapore who captures his Rolex Datejust Wimbledon dial on the road. I really like you. Let me know. I think, I think Audi, but let me know if I'm wrong. Uh, Jason N. Wait, nope, yep, hang on, one more. Uh, Andre Z of New Jersey enjoyed the weekend with his IWC Pilots Watch Mark 18, looking good. And Jason N, now you're up, takes us home with his wild Japanese domestic market Orient Flash LED light manual winder, both mechanical and electronic technology in one watch. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. And guys, follow me on Instagram. We will do more of these live chat extensive shows in the future. Until then, thanks to everyone who participated. Sean for making the magic happen. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.